Welcome to episode 90 of the one and only podcast. I'm Mark Shapiro, and since it's been a minute since I checked in and got real with you, I figured I would do so today. A lot has been happening, evolving, and changing in my life, so we have an episode for you today that is in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to share with you about my dad's passing, and in the second part, I'm going to share with you what's going on, what's real for me in these last eight or nine weeks. I wanted to share about my dad's passing for a few reasons. First, it is super real for me. It's what I'm going through right now, the grieving process. And secondly, I feel inclined to share because people continue to thank me for the way that I've shared and documented my dad's 17 plus year battle with Alzheimer's and people continue to tell me how it has been helpful to them in some sort of way. And a lot of people thank me for my courage as to the way that I've shared so publicly as well as the positive outlook and perspective that I've had in light of such a brutal reality and disease in my family. I'm going to talk about the grieving process and some of the challenges and changes that I've faced. It definitely feels like a rite of passage for me in a lot of ways, losing my father, and I am ready to step up to the plate and deliver both in terms of my goal and intention to bring more of what's real to the world. And in that regard, I have a ton of updates as to where I'm at, what I'm building here with the podcast, and are you being real? It's really interesting timing in that this is episode 90, so we are 90 episodes into the one and only podcast and quickly approaching the century mark of 100, which is wild for me. And it's just so crazy to me how everything is happening, changing at once. This week marks the one-year anniversary of two pretty major events for the One and Only podcast in that exactly one year ago, I came up with the idea for areyoubeingreal.com on the dance floor at Harvell's in a magical moment. It is also one year from the episode of the One and Only that I did with pop star Cody Simpson and one of my favorite artists, Dallas Clayton. So celebrating those milestones, which happened a year ago, and I'm excited to get more into it. So as I mentioned, two-part episode. The first part really documents my dad's passing. The second part in regards to my grieving process and some of the amazing changes, big changes, and what to expect coming in the future for the One and Only Podcast and Are You Being Real? This is a particularly special episode of the One and Only Podcast because I get to share about my dad. A while back, my good friend Zach Pucktell, who was the guest in episode two of the One and Only Podcast, he asked me, Mark, if you could have anyone on the One and Only Podcast, if you could interview anyone, who would you choose? And I thought to myself for a second, I thought about the obvious choices, people like President Obama, Oprah, Tony Robbins, and I mulled that over for a second. But the easy no-brainer answer for me is my dad. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible at the time because my dad was so far along with Alzheimer's disease and of course now he's passed. But my dad has been such an incredible role model to me and I'm so grateful for everything that he taught me and for all the time that we shared together. So the obvious answer is my dad and today I get to share about him with you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 90 of the one and only podcast. My dad, Alan Shapiro, passed away peacefully on September 11th at age 67. He was in the arms of his family and surrounded by a group of friends after going eight plus days with no food, water, or life support, and this comes after a 17 plus year battle with Alzheimer's disease, which I've documented on my Facebook, publicly, with videos over the last number of years. Before I share some reflections of my most cherished memories and some of the most valuable lessons I learned from my dad, which are applicable to anyone, first, let me tell you a little bit about him. Growing up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, my dad was a 1967 St. Louis Park High School state champion in track and field. 
before going on to be a four-time letterer at the University of Minnesota, also in track and field, where he was a member of the Big Ten championship team in 1968. After a quick dabble in medical school, my dad went on to attend the William Mitchell College of Law in Minnesota and then worked as a prosecutor for the city of St. Paul. In 1976, after the death of his father, also to Alzheimer's, my dad co-founded Shapko Printing with his two brothers in 1976, which became one of the top commercial printers in the nation, and it still exists today. Outside of work, my dad was also an active member in the community. He was elected president of the University of Minnesota Letterman's Club, and in his tenure, led a community-wide ticket drive for the Gopher Spring football game, which set an all-time attendance record, and he also founded the highly successful M-Club Raffle, which raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for the University of Minnesota Athletic Department. After successfully challenging the NCAA, my dad's M-Club Raffle became the standard for NCAA fundraising regulations. After his diagnosis of Alzheimer's, my dad became a face for young onset Alzheimer's disease awareness. And it goes without saying that he was a first-rate, loving, giving, and present father to my siblings, Scott, Stacy, and me, and a devoted husband to my mother, Carol. When deciding how I wanted to share what my dad means to me in this podcast episode, I thought about speaking off the cuff, sharing bits and pieces of the eulogy I presented, or simply sharing the eulogy. And since sharing the audio recording is available, I think that will give you the most authentic perspective of the experience and how much it meant for me to have the honor to speak on my dad's behalf. I think you will enjoy it and derive value, whether in the feelings, memories, or insight it evokes, or from the direct lessons and takeaways. So here it is, my speech at my dad's funeral. As I take a look around and see so many beautiful and familiar faces, I, I can't thank you enough for being here today and honoring my dad and all your support uh, over the last several years. It's an honor to be here, where my dad imparted words of wisdom to me 22 years ago on my bar mitzvah. As Scott mentioned, our bar mitzvah speeches are very special for us because our dad took the opportunity to share with us and impart his wisdom. Now, some of you may know my dad never admitted to having Alzheimer's disease. As a competitor, he wasn't willing to accept that diagnosis. And a result of that, Scott Stacy and I didn't get the words of wisdom and advice that we hoped for, or at least I would have hoped for, in his final days and final years. So I watch my bar mitzvah video every few months because, as Scott mentioned, the wisdom, the advice that he gave for me uh, back in 1994 still hold true to me today. And so it's an honor to be here, to return the favor, to honor my dad. And in true Alan Shapiro fashion, I've got some note cards, index cards, and based on their yellow color, they might have even been from the same package of cards that my dad spoke from at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> Imagine being in the presence of and learning from the gold standard in integrity, work ethic, kindness, and family values. Well, that's the privilege and gift that everyone, my dad interacted with and worked with and got to experience firsthand. And I am blessed to have grown up with this one-of-a-kind and irreplaceable blueprint that has shaped me into the man that I am today. I want to take that opportunity here to share with you a few of my greatest memories and pass along some of the wisdom that my dad passed on to me that supported me in my growth and development. As a kid, I'd watch my dad with a very close eye and always looked up to him. He had it all, success, a beautiful family, and unlimited joy and passion. I even dressed up as him at Lauren Stein's birthday party and chose Alan as my own middle name. And I mean, how could you blame me for wanting to emulate his incredible track record and ability to garner the respect of everyone that he came across? 
from watching him run at the Dyna Track and Crosstown Club and picking up the phone and cold calling just about anyone from his desk taught me the value of hard work, consistency, and courage. And walking around Shapko and him introducing me to the entire staff who absolutely loved him and the countless people who would approach him at sporting events, he simply knew everyone. Or at least they knew him. I'd often ask my dad, who was that person that just came up to you? And he'd say, I have no idea. And that was a long time before he was sick. But this taught me the importance of respect, kindness, courtesy, and communal contribution and leadership. From senior exec on down to security guard, my dad treated everyone the same and with care, and simply put, everybody wanted to be on his team and receive his incredible level of love and support. Just don't get excommunicated. Fortunately, Scott, Stacy, and I could do absolutely no wrong, and while we could be a pain in the ass at times and weren't always appreciative of having the best and most giving parents on the planet, my dad worked near 18 hours a day, and he was still there for us. From our sporting events, to plays, to taking us to gopher games, twins games, viking games, and family vacations, we did it all together. A man of incredible integrity, a rare thing in today's day and age, and my dad has been an exception to the rule. Sensitive to others, but unwavering to his moral code. I can't think of any vices, aside from maybe an obsession and addiction to success in accomplishing his goals. I mean, he hardly watched TV, never sped, and probably drank less alcohol than anyone in this room over the age of 16, and if you've ever taken a puff of a cigarette or a joint, you've smoked more than he ever did. And while I don't know if this quite fits the category of integrity, I must give credit where credit is due. While my dad gets widely recognized for his track championships and professional accolades, he rarely gets noted for getting through life with the incredible achievements of never doing laundry, washing dishes, or packing for a trip. <laughs> Though I gotta give credit to my mom on that one and my parents' beautiful, mutually exclusive distribution of responsibilities. And must take this opportunity to thank and laud my parents for their beautiful commitment and partnership, and especially my mom, for being there every second, no matter how difficult it was. Mom, dad knows he won the lottery and he was certainly never shy about letting you know. Despite my dad's Alzheimer's, which he battled for half of our time together, I still continue to learn from him today. As Len Levine said in a 1996 article, don't talk about losing to Alan Shapiro. Losing was simply not in his vocabulary and not even an option. And my dad certainly set the bar high as to my ambitions and what success ultimately looks like. He also taught me the importance in believing in myself. While he hammered this home, this point home on this very beam at my bar mitzvah, it wasn't until my own divorce and leaving Showtime to follow in my dad's entrepreneurial footsteps to really own that. While this was a big lesson for me, it appeared to be in my dad's DNA and the way that I saw him and the way that he viewed himself. While I thought he could play for the Twins as a kid, even though he wasn't a baseball player and was 40, and when I was a teenager, He'd argue that he could write for Seinfeld if he wanted to, but I guess he clearly didn't want to, because if he did, he would have. <laughs> and through his success and the way he battled Alzheimer's, I continue to learn the value of patience and resilience. Success didn't come easy for my dad and his brothers when they started Chapco Printing after the death of their father, and the will he exhibited back then Together with his marathon journey with Alzheimer's, there's no better example of strong will. As my dad said at my bar mitzvah, never ever give up on yourself, have faith, and know that everything is going to work out for the best. And if you want something bad enough, just go out and do it. Over the last few years, it's been a privilege to stand by my dad's side as an Alzheimer's advocate and share my experience in the hopes to serve and support others 
as scientists work diligently to develop treatments and a cure. Dealing with grief and expressing my experience publicly and vulnerably has become my forte. And as I've known this day has been coming and learned to subscribe to gratitude and really cherishing our time together and what remained versus what was lost and gone forever, I'm elated to learn in my dad's passing that while my dad is no longer in his beautiful, handsome, and athletic physical form, he's still alive inside me and alive inside all of us. And I invite everyone here to embrace and embody their favorite parts of my dad, whether that be the work ethic, believing in yourself, integrity, caring and kindness, communal contribution, or taking excellent care of your health. In closing, the times with my dad that I'm most grateful for are our bedtime chats, where my dad would tuck me in, put me at ease, and tell me stories about his parents and his childhood, and would always close out these special times with a consistent message. So dad, I leave you with this. I love you, and I'm proud of you. I think you can tell how special it was for me. And to give you a little more added insight into the power of that speech my dad gave to me at my bar mitzvah in November of 1994, 22 years ago, here is a few minutes of that speech, which brings me to tears every single time I watch it. And this will give you a firsthand experience of hearing my dad's voice. Here it is. Enjoy. Mark, I'm holding up in my right hand the top 10 list of white cards full of information about Mark Shapiro, which I plan to share with you this morning. Mark, first, congratulations. You were outstanding today, and all your family and friends are very proud of you. You've lived a kid's life to the fullest. You've played most ground and water sports, and you love camping, acting, singing, and having fun with your friends. And that's the way it should be. Mark, you've always been a great athlete and a key player on your teams. You always play tough and with great intensity. In key situations during basketball and baseball games, you want to be the person taking the last shot or having the last at bat. My proudest moment of you in sports took place last summer when you were playing in the Edina Traveling Baseball League. We had a game in Austin, Minnesota on the 4th of July. Mark's team was uh, trailing badly in the second inning and the coach brought him in the pitch with the bases loaded and no outs. The only problem was he had only pitched a couple innings the entire season and the other team was ready just to put him away. Mark came in, got out of the inning, pitched six innings, gave up one run and one walk and led his team to victory. And it was also an honor for me, Mark, for the last five years to coach your basketball team. It was great fun, except for dealing with some of the parents. But Mark, as Mom said, your Torah portion addresses the issue of personal struggles that occur in everyone's life. Like most kids, sometimes you get down on yourself when dealing with what's happening either at school or in your social or family life. And let's look at an example involving schools. As Mom said, you've never had a problem really retaining all the major concepts that you have to learn, and you've always tested well. But you've had difficulty seeing the purpose of memorizing all the detail which you're probably going to forget anyway right after you take the class. Well, let me put it this way to you. Society has set up a a set of hoops that you've got to jump through in order for you to qualify for opportunities later in life. Regarding school, it's obviously in your best interest to work hard and get the best grades possible, and that involves a substantial amount of memorization. But once you jump through these hoops, it becomes a whole new ballgame when you get out of school. At that time, you can compete against everybody else in your field on an even basis when general intelligence, street smarts, personality, people skills, and common sense play a more important role. And these are all your best qualities. Just because, though, a person does not jump through all the hoops does not mean that they're not capable or smart. However, their goals may be more difficult to achieve. And Mark, everyone struggles and faces disappointment in their lives. On occasion, you may not make a sports team, or earn a part in a play, or be hired for your dream job. But like my mom told me, and my grandma Marino always, despite the pitfalls in my life, that everything's going to work out for the best. 
So be aggressive and always try to reach your goal. If you want it bad enough, just go out and do it, even if the odds are stacked against you. And Mark, besides being your dad, we're also very, very close friends. I am always impressed when you, when you ask me when I get home from work looking like I just finished a marathon in last place, Dad, how did your day go when I get home from work? I also enjoy our private time together and when we kid around with each other. But above all, I cherish our bedtime talks when we discuss life in general and I tell you stories from the past. And I know you're a great actor, but you pretend to enjoy those stories. <laughs> But it means the most to me when you ask me to tell you stories about my parents because it helps me keep them alive for me. So Mark, take it from your dad. Never, never give up on yourself. You're a wonderful, good-looking boy with many outstanding characteristics. You always rise to the occasion like you did today, and you have what it takes to be successful, as anybody who is here today can see. You also have a big heart, and you care deeply about your friends and your family. I know you can cope with your personal struggles and be happy with yourself. Jewish tradition tells us that starting today, you're now a Jewish adult with added responsibilities, and I know you're up to the task. Mark, I love you, and I want to thank you for being my son, who has given me so much pleasure and love. And thank God for our family, our friends, and our tradition. I'm done. <laughs> it is so special for me to have access to this video and audio recording and to be able to watch it whenever I want. It keeps my dad alive. I can see him. I can hear him. And to get those words of wisdom, which still hold true today, I am so incredibly grateful. You may have noticed that when delivering my eulogy, I did my best to articulate it in the same voice that my dad presented to me in at my bar mitzvah on November 19th, 1994. I felt my family did a beautiful job paying homage and honoring my dad at his funeral. And countless people approached me to share that it was one of the most inspiring funerals they had been to, if that's even possible or a thing, which I think is a testament to my family's strength, acceptance, and positive outlook on life. And we didn't shy away from the pain we experienced along the way. My mom, brother Scott, and cousin Drew Levine each shared powerfully and beautifully. And if you have any interest in hearing their speeches, I will post a link on the show notes page. To close out part one of this episode, there are two final things I wanted to share. First, it warmed my heart to get a call from the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the local paper, a few days after the funeral to produce a hero feature story on my dad. Given how much he served the community and how long he was sick, it was so special to see him celebrated and recognized in such a beautiful and public fashion. And second, I wanted to thank you for hitting me with a tsunami of love. I received over 500 personalized messages and am also really appreciative for those who shared their love in other ways, whether liking a Facebook post or a pic or thinking of my dad and family. I couldn't be more grateful for all the love in my life and for your support. And because I was so touched, it also sparked me to contemplate how I can best articulate and receive that love, which resulted in me sending voice and video replies to as many of the 500 direct messages as possible. And it also sparked a new social experiment that I will tell you about in part two. For the remainder of the episode, I'm going to share with you about these last eight weeks since my dad's passing and where I'm at in general. It feels very much to me like a rite of passage, and I want to open up and share with you how things are going, how I've dealt with the grief, and what I am committed to creating here for the future. Going back to eight, nine weeks ago, I would just gotten back from a phenomenal week at Burning Man, spent my dad's last final days by his side, and I stuck around in Minneapolis to be there for my mom for about a week and a half after the funeral. So I come back to LA, and I haven't really done much work for about three weeks' time, which was a record for me since leaving Showtime, making the big jump, and starting the podcast. 
I've been so passionate and so invested in loving what I'm doing, yet working around the clock. And I found it tough for me to separate myself from my vision and from my work. Well, here it was three weeks, kind of forced a little bit with my dad's passing. And I'm back in LA and I feel like I have zero momentum professionally. Also, I'm exhausted. My body hurts. I'm emotionally drained from my dad passing away and I'm feeling this grief and I don't really know where to go next. I don't know if I should just dive back into work or let myself really feel this pain and this process and get back to work when it feels right and appropriate. And I'm honestly still working to create that exact balance. There are some days where I feel super motivated and on point. And there's other days where I just want to sit back and relax and do pretty much nothing. When I initially got back, it was very hard to string together consecutive days of momentum and progress. But I found that over time, I've been able to string together consecutive days, consecutive weeks, and I feel like I'm back in the flow, but it's taken seven, eight weeks. This was really a reminder for me that it's okay to have days where I'm not on point, flowing, super productive all day long. And I had a good excuse here because I was going through grief, but in reality, it's a lesson that I think I can take even when I'm not experiencing grief. There's some days that I'm in flow and I know you can relate where you feel like you're in big time flow and there's other days where you're not and that's okay. Just not letting those days that you're not in flow become a week or a month or a year. So to tap back into that passion and into that productive flow state. And based on results over the last year and a half, I go through waves. And sometimes I'm super inspired and there are weeks that I'm not. And you know what? I'm cool with it. So since my dad has passed, it feels like there's a lot that has changed. And then at the same time, it feels like almost nothing has changed. In regards to the latter, my dad's been sick with Alzheimer's for so long, he hadn't spoken really in the last five, six years of his life, that him passing away, it actually didn't feel that different because I wasn't able to communicate with him in the way that I had remembered as a kid. The man, the role model that I'd always really looked up to. He was a really a shell of his former self the last several years of his life. So in that sense, it didn't really feel like a big change. And honestly, I was very accepting of the fact that my dad passed away. It was clearly his time, and I feel like he's in a better place. On the flip side, it feels like everything has changed. Now that my dad is no longer in his physical body, when I think of him, I think of him in a different light because he's no longer here with us. And instead of being able to picture him in Minnesota at the home that he lived in, now he lives within me. And I look to him for guidance. And he shows up in different moments in my life, specifically in those situations where I cherished him most or where there are memories. So for example, when I'm at the gym, I'll think about the times that we went to the track down the street from our house And I'd sit there and I'd watch and admire him run and I'd run along his side as at least as long as I could keep up with him. But when I'm at the gym and I'm feeling myself tiring out and ready to give up, I ask myself, what would my dad do here in this situation? So it's really special to have that inner guide now and know that my dad is there with me when I'm in need. Another thing that's been interesting about his passing is the role of tradition. And if I've been mentioning throughout the episode, it feels like a rite of passage. And I feel like it's time for me to step it up and to be even more responsible than I've been. Uh, So far, I've been stepping up, I think, a lot in terms of my responsibility the last couple of years, but I'm committed to taking it to another level. And one thing that I'm thinking about in terms of tradition and legacy is my dad's roots and the Shapiro family. And with my dad's passing and the tradition, I am finding myself more connected to my Jewish faith and not necessarily in terms of the prayers, 
but just honoring and respecting my familial lineage and everything that my ancestors on the Shapiro side of the family went through in order for me to be here today. I was really touched at my cousin Carrie's wedding a few weeks ago when she was walking down the aisle. I just started bawling. And I was bawling because I realized that the reason why I was there and supported my cousin was because that's my dad's legacy. That's my dad's side of the family. And it's my time now to represent and to really continue on my dad's legacy and continue on the Shapiro name. So it was a really powerful moment for me. The last thing that I want to share about the grief is I'm finding myself shifting. When I practice authenticity, specifically in the past, it's been very much on an intellectual level. I'll ask myself a lot of questions. Am I being real about what's working and what's not working in my life? Professionally, am I being real about where I'm willing to and not willing to go? For example, this year, I've been putting myself out there more and more, sharing more vulnerably like I've done on Facebook Live, doing more video, putting myself out there. So I'm analytical about my authenticity. And I'm finding myself shifting more into an energetic and spiritual place. And what I'm committed to right now, what feels right for me right now, is to create a greater connection to my heart and to be able to tap into my intuition. So you've probably noticed that in recent episodes of the One and Only Podcast, but I'm really looking to have a a nice balance between that intellectual practice of authenticity as well as a more spiritual and energetic practice. So as I've been dealing with this grief, it's been a wave of emotions getting back into the flow of work. When I first got back to LA, it was tough for me socially because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to share what I was going through with other people. It was really tough for me. And professionally, I had an Are You Being Real workshop on the calendar that I canceled because I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. And at the same time, I was getting ready to launch the next cycle of my eight-week mastermind program, Winning Weeks. And I love Winning Weeks. It's a phenomenal program, supports high achievers and leveling up, stepping up their game, creating greater balance in their lives, greater routines to support them in being most effective, happy, and fulfilled. Yet in order to have Winning Weeks, you need to have people in it. And that would require me to put myself out there and to enroll people in the program and to promote it and to market it. And honestly, that was the last thing that I wanted to do a couple of weeks after my dad passed away. You know, when you walk onto an airplane and they've got the safety video playing, they always say to put on your own oxygen mask before you put it on somebody else because in order to really truly support others, you need to be taking care of yourself and be healthy first. And I was really struggling with that when I was getting ready to launch Winning Weeks. So the way I kind of got around that is I put together a testimonials video from the first Winning Weeks. I had 10, 12 amazing testimonials from people who were in the program. And I put together a video, and I'm not even in the video. So that was my way around me being the face, putting myself out there, and promoting Winning Weeks, at least initially when I started marketing the program. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about Winning Weeks because this is real for me. I set a goal of having 30 to 40 people in this mastermind program. And to keep in mind, I had 15 people in Winning Weeks the first time that I launched the program. I reached out to about 150 people that I really wanted to have in the program with personal invitations, video messages, audio messages. And when it was all said and done, 20 people are in Winning Weeks. And these are 20 incredible people up to big things in their life. So I was very pleased with that. Yet at the same time, I was pretty disappointed that I didn't reach my goal of 30 to 40 people. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you is I learned some valuable lessons along the way. The first lesson that I learned is that by setting a high goal, 30 to 40 people, when I only had 15 people in it the first time, is it allowed me to push past where I had previously gone with winning weeks and with goal setting. So I think setting the goal of 30 to 40 allowed me to get to 20 versus if I just had a goal of 20, maybe I would have ended up with 15. 
And while it's easy for me to look at that gap of 10, 15 people as a reason to be disappointed, I'm really pleased with the 20 people that are in the program. And it also is a reminder to me not to get ahead of myself. When I first launched Winning Weeks this summer, I had no idea if it would work, who would sign up, and fortunately, it was a big success, and the 15 people in the program generated great results, and we're really pleased with the program. So what did I do? I got ahead of myself, and I was instantly looking at how can I grow this thing as big as possible and turn this into a big business, and in that, I got a little ahead of myself. So I learned the lesson here 20 people was the magical number, and that's how many people were supposed to be in winning weeks this round, and I am excited about the future of this program. It's phenomenal, and the results so far in the second round have been terrific, and I know that when winning weeks is meant to have 50, 60, 70, 80, 120 people, it'll happen when it's supposed to happen, and I'm going to enjoy the process and put my best foot forward until I get to that point. The next thing that I want to share about is what I am creating. To me, I feel like I'm at a crossroads. I feel like I've got a great base and foundation below me, which I've been building here for the last year and a half with the one and only podcast here in episode 90 and with winning weeks and with my Instagram, which I've been really passionate about and putting pouring my heart into. And I'm wondering what's next. And honestly, my goal here is to bring more of what's real to the world. I want to live in a world where more people have the courage to look within, to really get in touch with what's true for them, what they want most, and to share their greatest gifts in the world while supporting others in sharing their gifts as well. Because I think if we lived in that kind of world, more people would be shining. And frankly, I think that that kind of world would have more peace and less war. So that's what I'm committed to creating. But honestly, I can't do it all on my own. And right now, Are You Being Real, which I came up with that idea exactly a year ago this week, which is pretty cool. But Are You Being Real, the one and only podcast, if it's just my voice and the voice of the person that I'm interviewing every week, it's probably not going to happen. So I've been looking and exploring different ways where I can add more voices to the brand, to the concept, so we can really get this message out there and make an impact. So I've got all sorts of ideas in mind as to how we're going to accomplish that, and I'm excited to share that in future weeks. And together with having more voices, whether having more people share on the Instagram page, the Are You Being Real Instagram, or on my Facebook page, I'm committed to doing that and wanted to throw that out there to you. Because if you have a similar vision, if you want to speak up and share your authentic voice, I would love to collaborate and partner with you. Collaboration is one of the biggest words that I'm focusing on right now. Not just a word, but just an overall intention. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. But I think that that is going to be the magical formula that supports me and my vision of getting this word out there and making a greater impact in the world. With collaboration, I got a great lesson in what's possible with collaboration from my good friend, Justin Brown. I had Justin Brown on the podcast earlier this summer. He is the founder of IdeaPod, this very creative, innovative way of sharing ideas that will benefit the world. And Justin approached me about a month ago with the invitation to have a show, a Facebook live show on the IdeaPod Facebook page. So I've been doing that for about the last month. I'll interview someone for the one and only, and then we'll go live on Facebook and talk about authentic ideas. And it's been super fun, and it's been a beautiful way to collaborate. IdeaPod has a reach of well over 100,000 followers, And it's been a great opportunity for me to share my message and what I stand for with even more people. And that's exactly what I want to do with the Are You Being Real brand. I want to have more voices in the conversation talking about what it means to be real. The next thing that I want to share about is creativity. 
I realized that in order to get this message out there, I need to be doing things that other people aren't doing. Things that are creative, things that are impactful, things that are shareable and memorable. And that's where I'm committed to going. As I've mentioned throughout this episode, I've made a lot of video messages, audio messages, and I found that they've really been impactful in terms of creating relationship. And it all started after my dad's passing when I got those 500 personalized messages and I didn't know how I could possibly show my appreciation. And what I decided to do was make those video and audio messages and show my love and gratitude. And I'm committed to doing even more of that. And one thing that I'm doing for fun because I care is I'm sending a personalized video message to every single one of my Facebook friends on their birthday. And this includes people that I went to high school with that the only correspondence that I've had with them between high school and now, which dates back 16 years, is the one moment that we became Facebook friends with a single click. So that's what I'm doing. I'm putting myself out there and I'm excited to see what comes of it. And ideas like that, creative things that I can do to engage with people in authentic ways, to show people that I care, to go deeper than what's generally accepted in society. That's where I'm going with Are You Being Real? So I'm really excited about what's in store and what's ahead. Another really big development here in the last eight weeks is I'm going to be working with Aaron Kamiko on Are You Being Real and everything that I've been creating. This is a huge move for me because for the last year and a half, it's essentially been a one-man show. I've been carrying all the weight on my shoulders aside from getting some support with the one and only from Freedom Podcasting. The team over there does a terrific job. And getting support from the BS agency, Thomas Brodel and Matthew Shilkrit, with the Are You Being Real branding and Damon Meta on building areyoubeingreal.com. For the most part, I'm booking guests for the podcast. I am prepping for the podcast, which I do a substantial amount of research before the episodes. I market it and promote them. I make every single one of those Instagram memes on Instagram that I just absolutely love and I'm having a great time with together with winning weeks and everything else. The list goes on and on and on. And frankly, I'm coming up with the ideas faster than I can implement them, and I'm exhausted. My plate's been absolutely full. So starting to work with Erin is a blessing, and I'm so grateful for her, and I can't wait to introduce you to Erin actually next week. We've got a really untraditional episode of The One and Only that I'm excited to share with you where Erin and I ask each other vulnerable questions and get super real with each other. So that episode is coming next week and it was just super cool. Aaron found me on Instagram and here we are working together and you know having someone on the payroll now puts my ass on the line to deliver and I will tell you I am committed to it. Lastly, one final change is Jeffrey Turnick, my best friend for 16 years and my roommate, housemate for the last three years. He moved out this week to head to the beach and I'm very excited for Jeff and I'm also excited to have some additional space here in my home and to see what opens up in general. When you put it all together, a lot is changing in my life very rapidly. So much goodness is developing. And for that, I am so grateful and excited. And honestly, I'm scared. I'm scared. I don't know what's to come, but I promise you and assure you that, and I assure myself that I'm going to put my best foot forward and I'm going to live my core values and be in integrity and be courageous and continue to take smart risks that will support me in my own personal growth and to hopefully make the impact that I desire with the world and in the world and everything that I touch. So that is my commitment. And I know I'm putting myself out there when saying that. And even if people don't get it, that's okay because I'm going to do it anyway. As I wrap up this episode, I have a few final closing thoughts. When I look at what I learned from my dad, in addition to the strong will, believing in myself, 
is probably the other biggest lesson. And I've doubted myself so much throughout my life. And I'm really proud of myself that I've become the man that I am today and that I believe in myself and know that if I work hard enough, if I believe in something so firmly that I can accomplish it. One other thing that I've been thinking about a lot with my dad, he died at the age 67 and was really very sick for the last 17, 18 years of his life. So he had 50 good years to live. And based on everything I shared earlier and all of his successes and accomplishments, I think it's fair to say that he made the most of his time here in this world. And it evoked me to ask myself the question, if I were to die tomorrow, would I be happy and fully satisfied, fulfilled with the life that I led? And if I were to rewind the clock three, four years ago, when I was still working my corporate job, I would easily say no. I had a lot of fun times, great relationships, but I knew I was capable of something more. And over the last three years, and especially since launching the podcast, I've broken down so many walls. I've gotten out of my shell. I've learned to have the courage to speak up, to stand up for what I believe in. And I can honestly say that if I were to die tomorrow, I would be happy with my life and the legacy that I'm leaving behind. So I invite you to ask yourself the question, are you happy, fulfilled with the life that you're leading? And if you were to go tomorrow, would you be pleased with the foot that you put forward? If yes, amazing. Thank you for having the courage to share your gifts with the world. And if the answer is no, that's okay too. Every moment is a new moment. And just because you've been one way or several ways in the past, you have the opportunity now and in every moment of your life to choose who you want to be moving forward. So on that note, thank you so much for supporting me in my growth and supporting me and my vision to bring more of what's real and authentic to the world. I can't wait to see what we create next. If you have a similar vision, if you want to get involved and collaborate, let me know. My email is mark at areyoubeingreal.com. I'd love to hear from you and to work together to make this a better place for all.